Let's wrap it up with uh, with Nathaniel Purcell, uh, W2NAF. He's going to talk about the solar eclipse QSO party. How many people are, are planning on participating in that? Oh, that's great. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Take, take away. Thank you very much, Lord. Um, so I think Anga and Bill did such a great job introducing many of the atmospheric effects we know about and some of the um, uh, planned experiments we have for studying the, uh, the changes on the atmosphere caused by the eclipse. Um, I'm going to talk about another one. <laughs> and this one is very near, near and dear to ham radio operators' hearts. And that's because many of us as ham radio operators, we love to operate. We love just making QSOs. And, and we don't quite know why. Maybe it's because it's exotic talking to that faraway place, or we like having a really high rate during that contest, or we just like the crackle of the static, or we like setting up you know, for field day, uh, like we are over here. And what we do is we log all of these contacts, we compute statistics on them, and we upload them to Logbook of the World. Uh, but but then what happens after that? Can we do anything more with that than just you know, writing things down in the logbook? Um, another system that has been developed by ham radio operators recently is something called the Reverse Beacon Network. ESP Reporter is similar, and so is WhisperNet. Reverse Beacon Network is an automated spotting network for CW and radio teletype transmissions. Where if you call CQ on CW or radio teletype right now, and you go to this Reverse Beacon Network website, you will automatically see who around the world has heard you. And again, it's similar to the logbook. It just keeps track of who has been talking when on what frequencies. And uh, my I looked at this and I said, oh wow, I wonder if we can actually learn something about the ionosphere, about space weather from doing this. I took a very simple case and I said, well, how about during a solar flare? We're all familiar with this concept of a radio blackout. So I plotted 15 minutes worth of reverse speaking network paths. So these are actual ham radio um, QSOs going on, color-coded by band around the world. And then I found a period right after this map was made, there was an X-class solar flare observed by the NOAA GOES satellite. Guess what happened to the HF propagation over North America? That's right, I see this thumbs down. And yep, sure enough, that's exactly what the reverse beacon network showed. Daylight was over here, and you, so we still had some communications in Europe where it was night, but yeah, it really wiped out. And the reverse beacon network just made it so clear, you could see this effect right away. And, and I, I thought that was neat. So we continue, we're continuing to develop other techniques to try and use this data um, for scientific purposes. This is still a very experimental technique, but some of you, how many people here are familiar with ionosons? So quite a few. And uh, how many people know what FOF2 is? Okay. So FOF2, uh, for all intents and purposes, I'll say an ionosonde is a device used to measure the ionosphere. It's a vertical incidence radar uh, operating at HF. And FOF2 um, is related to the maximum usable frequency. Um, people are probably familiar with the MUF. How many people are familiar with the MUF? More people. So that's good. So it's related to the maximum usable frequency. So we're working on techniques where you can use reverse speaking network data, whisper net data, to predict um, not only the MUF, but also the FOF2, which is a more scientific value. And here you can see very nicely that the values are low at night time, and then you can see this nice gradient across the dawn as you get into daylight over here. And this is all computed using reverse speed network data. Um, there is a lot of data out there. So um, my undergrad, Josh, he went and looked and found out how big the database sizes for these networks are. And for, um, at least for WhisperNet and RBN, you can go to their website right now. You can download the data and look at it yourself. PSK reporter, you might have to uh, email Bill Gladstone and ask him for some information. But these database sizes are large, uh, 44 gigabytes, 36 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes. And they've been operating back since 2008. So we have a nice historical database we can look at. So there's a lot of data out there. We're constantly looking for ways to measure things. But we have a few <laughs> techniques which I just showed you already. So, what does this have to do with what's coming up with the solar eclipse? Well, Magda already very nicely showed these plots before. Um, we, we can see from previous experiments that we can see changes in that FOF2 value that will affect propagation. And these changes can last 
for about up to four hours based on previous studies. And uh, this uh, plot over here shows this is a numerical um, prediction uh, or model of what happens at 280 kilometers altitude right in the F region uh, for the eclipse in 1999. And so these are some fairly recent studies, but only recently have we had the power and the capability to do these big picture uh, scientific studies of what happens during an eclipse. And because of the tools like the internet, better computational power, widespread and distributed uh, networks of uh, instrumentation. But you know what? Eclipses are very rare, um, especially over well-instrumented network well-instrumented areas, and so we still, even in spite of these advances, we don't have a good understanding of what's going on during an eclipse. We have like point measurements, we have some models, we still don't have a lot of data. And so that's where, you know, we as ham radio operators come in. Um, Magda and the Virginia Tech team, they're running a research program using professional scientific instruments to measure what's going to happen during the eclipse. But they're only located in certain places, and they don't have full coverage over the entire eclipse area. <coughs> we as ham radio operators, we're able to uh, cover the entire continent of the US with signals that could help complement these professional instruments. And that's really valuable. And so that's where I'm at NGIT. I'm leading the group that's trying to figure out how to use this ham radio data um, in such a way to uh, complement these other instruments. And so that's where we're coming up with the Solar Eclipse QSO party. And this is different from some previous Solar Eclipse QSO parties because we're taking this imaging approach. We're trying to uh, reach out and ask camera operators to do something that they do best, which is just operate. So we want to flood the airways, the HF airways, with signals. And so by generating lots of QSOs, we should be able to image the ionosphere similarly to the way I've just shown. So we're going to have a solar eclipse QSO party. It's going to be, you can think of it kind of like field day or a June VHF contest or, or one of these you know, other big contests. So if, you're, if you like contest operating, this is for you. We need lots of QSOs, lots of great. Um, and so if you go look at the rules, the rules for this contest, even though it is, or it's or the operating event, it's technically not a contest. The rules for this are going to be very similar to the contests that we all know and love as ham radio operators. But, but the data and from the logs and the reverse speaker network and PSP recorder and WhisperNet, they're going to go be used afterward to help us understand something big scientifically. So this is going to take place August 21st from 1400 to 2200 UT. Uh, this starts two hours before partial eclipse starts in Oregon and ends two hours after partial eclipse ends in South Carolina. So that way we see before, during, and after the eclipse. It's going to be contest-like. We're giving two points per QSO for CW and digital because those are the modes that can be observed by these automated networks. One point for phone, so your uh, user-submitted logs still provide us with data. And we're going to multiply the score by the number of grid squares you work. So we're doing, I think, six character grid squares. So there's your multiplier. One interesting change from a regular um, contest is we want people to work each other again every 10 minutes. So you can, and this will help that whole idea of creating lots of QSOs to flood the atmosphere. Uh, the exchange is your real Q, your real RST, so not just your 599, but try and do your best. Well, okay, I'll put it this way. If you, if you feel like you can do your best by getting your rate up with 599, go do that. And, and the reason I say that is things like the reverse speaking network, um, things like uh, PSP recorder, they do make signal to noise ratio measurements too. So we're going to get that information from you later. And just knowing who can contact who is sometimes enough to give us some useful information. And then of course, I already talked about the data sources. Um, bonus points. Um, I think you can read these on our website, campsite.org. Um, a couple of interesting highlights, if you operate during totality, you get 100 points. But you say, I want to be able to see totality or see the eclipse at the same time. If you operate outdoors so you can see the eclipse, you also get 100 points. If you op so you can think field day style. Field day is good practice for the solar eclipse QSO party. Operating at a public venue, 100 points. Uh, give us some extra information about what types of antennas you are, you get extra points for. And um, 
operate a reverse beacon network node, come to the ham side booth, and we can show you how to set up a reverse beacon network node. And another interesting thing is, after the event, when we post the final scores to the ham side website, we're also going to be including uh, points for if you were spotted by RBM PSK reporter or the DX cluster. So that so now for the first time in a contest, you'll actually get points for being spotted. That's just for <laughs> <laughs> and, and this, there's actually a really good reason for this because for us, you know, we also want to know when the bands are, are closed, right? So if you're operating at 10 meters and you get spotted by the guy down the street by the river speaking network, you know, 50 miles away from you, but if you're not making any QSOs, that's useful information to us because we know that you are actually transmitting because we can see you in that one RBN receiver, but we also know that the band is closed elsewhere. And so we have information on the website about how to submit your logs, um, how to, um, we'll have something where you can get a participation certificate after you submit your log. We're still working on getting that part of that website going, but we will have that. And um, finally, as a conclusion and summary, so the data from these efforts are going to both help science and ham radio. I think this is going to be a really fun operating event. And I hope that everyone has a chance to participate in the solar eclipse in SDQP. Remember, even if you're not under totality, anywhere in uh, North America, pretty much, you will see at least a partial eclipse. And your data, your logs, your QSs are going to help the effort. Um, the SDQP is just one way to help out. You've heard about the eclipse mob. You can go to hamside.org. We have other ways to help out. And finally, I want to say that we have a really great opportunity to enjoy our ham radio hobby, experience the beauty of nature, and contribute to science all at the same time. So with that, I want to say thank you, and I would like to We would, of course, we'd like all amateur bands to be tested, but we are not going to have a major operating event on the WARC bands because that would cause a problem. Um, of course, we hope that WhispernET operations will fill in for that. Safety point: the camera. Yes. Do not look at the sun directly. Or a number 14 welder silver is safe. Uh, go to the uh, any one of my sky and telescope sites and they will help you to figure that out. Uh, that, that big black hole in your slide, yeah, there's one of those right over my station in speed days. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, folks. We have a forum, uh, evaluation forum. I'll be out and the volunteers. Thank you. We'll see you on the air.